And on behalf of the education and research centers throughout the country, we're pleased to present the Industrial Hygiene Webinar Series, offering free webinars the second Tuesday of each month. This collaborative effort is on behalf of each ERC's continuing education program and aspires to provide access to current research supported through NIOSH ERC programs. We're really glad you could be here with us today. Today's webinar, The Air Surface Interface of Viral Contamination, What Can Exposure Modeling Tell Us, is brought to you by the Rocky Mountain Center for Occupational and Environmental Health and Dr. Amanda Wilson. A few housekeeping items first. You're going to be muted during the presentation. If you'd like to enter the ask a question, please enter it into the online Q&A box. We'll be saving time at the end of the presentation to address as many questions as possible. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available on the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health YouTube page. And all participants who logged in today with their registration email for the live presentation will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording and an evaluation form, and that form will qualify you for a certificate of completion with one continuing education contact hour. Once the evaluation is completed, you'll be able to access and print your certificate. At this time, it's my pleasure to welcome our presenter. Amanda Wilson, PhD, MS, is a postdoctoral researcher at the Rocky Mountain Center for Occupational and Environmental Health, University of Utah. She completed her PhD and MS in Environmental Health Sciences at the University of Arizona, where her training focused on quantitative microbial risk assessment, exposure science, and exposure modeling. Her research interests include infectious disease, healthcare-associated infections, exposure modeling, and risk assessment. She is inspired and motivated by multidisciplinary collaborative work to address complex health problems, and looks to expand her current research focus by exploring methodologies for addressing risk-risk trade-offs that arise out of intervention implementation. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Wilson. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, so without further ado, I'll get started. Thank you for your time and your attention today. I'd first like to acknowledge that uh, the work I'll be presenting today, I didn't do in isolation. Um, I did it in collaboration with some amazing people, so I wanted to give them credit. Some of these uh, researchers are from the University of Arizona, the University of Utah, and the University of Leeds. I also want to acknowledge that there are a lot of different funding sources that help support it, our time related to this work. And I believe the slides um, will be available upon request. So I'll make sure to send those to Michelle um, if you'd like more details or more time to read through this material. The learning objectives for today are to number one, describe the relationship between aerosol and fomite transmission routes and their relative contributions to exposures to respiratory viral pathogens. The second objective is to review how human behaviors are incorporated into exposure modeling and their importance to estimating exposures and risks. And the third aim is to discuss the quantitative microbial risk assessment or QMRA framework for characterizing microbial exposures and risks. So I'm first going to start by introducing this quantitative microbial risk assessment or QMRA framework. And I'm gonna be using this framework as a way to sort of scaffold some examples of research where we've used a QMRA framework to answer certain questions with exposure modeling. The first component of QMRA is hazard identification. And this step often involves learning more about the organism itself, how it's transmitted and the types of diseases that it can cause once it infects an individual. The next part of this process is exposure assessment, and this is one of my favorite pieces of QMRA where we're trying to understand the fate and transport of pathogens in the environment. And this is often accounting for human behaviors and how different those may be based on the types of activities that we're doing in different indoor spaces or outdoor spaces, and then looking at the viability of the pathogen in the environment. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we um, use in QMRA to inform that exposure assessment. In addition to environmental microbiology and looking for the pathogen directly in these environments or looking at indicator organisms, another component of the exposure assessment piece is using mechanistic modeling. And I like to define mechanistic modeling because I think oftentimes when we hear the term mathematical models or modeling, our minds jump to statistical models. As opposed to looking at whether a relationship between parameters is occurring, what the direction of that relationship is or what the magnitude is, mechanistic modeling is more focused on how these things are related. What is the physical mechanism or connection that's um, describing the relationship between these parameters? And this often is related to 
us trying to quantify the fate and transport of contaminants, or in this case, microbes in an indoor environment. So some different pieces that we have to consider within building these type of exposure models is accounting for human behavior and how that behavior might vary based on the scenarios that we're interested in. The, pres the presence of the pathogen in the environment, whether it's actually viable and capable of causing infection and the different transmission routes. And the part I'm really gonna focus on today is their interactions. I think we oftentimes talk about these transmission routes in isolation. Is it fomite mediated? Is it airborne? Is it droplets? And while one of those transmission routes may dominate uh, what we're seeing in terms of infection transmission, we wanna think about how, how all of these uh, transmission routes are related in indoor environments and what that means for exposure and risk. The next component of QMRA is dose response, where we use quantitative relationships to relate a dose to a probability of some health outcome. Typically, the outcome we're interested in is infection, but there are a lot of other outcomes and different dose response curves fits, fit for certain outcomes such as mortality or even organism specific outcomes such as stillbirth for um, infections due to Listeria monocytogenes. All of these pieces come together to inform risk assessment. So we're bringing together what we know about the pathogen, what we know about its fate and transport, and how much dose we expect to result in some type of outcome. And this is allowing us to characterize variability and uncertainty and risk. So this framework often implements a, a Monte Carlo approach where we're using distributions to represent different parameters to describe fate and transport, exposure, and risk in order to give a distribution of risk. All of these different pieces are related and this framework is very iterative. For example, the hazard identification is going to inform the way we approach our exposure assessment. And the exposure assessment and dose response are working together to characterize risks for specific exposure scenarios. The more we learn about different risks for different scenarios that may give us insights about uh, the pathogen itself. And so this system can evolve and be used to um, approach QMRA in, in new settings as we gain more information. So I'm going to be revisiting our learning objectives to kind of um, help gauge which slides are addressing which learning objectives so that if you want to review this material, it's clear what slides are contributing to what objectives. Some of the work I'll be presenting today related to QMRA examples is emphasizing this idea of multi-barrier approaches. And I love this figure from um, Ian McRae on Twitter, which is the Swiss cheese approach. And I love cheese and I love infectious diseases. And this was an interesting intersection of those passions. And this is basically demonstrating that no intervention is foolproof, but when we use them in combination, we're increasing our ability to mitigate risk. And so I'm going to be coming back to this idea, thinking about how one intervention or multiple interventions can address multiple routes of transmission. And so this question is, how do the cheese slices relate to one another? Does one cheese slice relate to multiple transmission routes, or is, it, uh, is that intervention designed to specifically address one transmission route of interest? The first example I'll give is some recent work that we've done related to emergency medical service personnel and COVID-19 exposures. I won't go too in, into too much detail regarding hazard ID because I'm sure we've all heard enough about COVID-19 for a lifetime, um, but this work was focused on SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus responsible for COVID-19. And there has been some evidence showing that healthcare workers have paid a big price in terms of COVID-19 exposures um, and these occupational risks that they're facing during the pandemic. Our next phase is exposure assessment. And we wanted to explore a number of different scenarios. These scenarios are assumed to occur in an ambulance. Our first scenario is two first responders caring for a COVID-19 patient. The first responders are not wearing respirators and the patient is not wearing a respirator or mask. And this is what we're calling sub-scenario 1A no one with respirators. Subscenario B is the patient with a respirator. Subscenario C is the first responders with respirators. And then subscenario D is everyone wearing respirators. 
We then wanted to look at how the behaviors regarding respirator use in that first scenario affect another scenario or a following ride with a non-COVID-19 patient. So we're calling this scenario two, where we're assuming that there's been some virus that has deposited on fomites due to the first ride with the infected patient. And now we're looking at how that could affect uh, risks for the first responders in the second scenario. For this work, we were using a compartment model. So I'm not gonna go through every little box in this figure, but I wanted to show and highlight some different components that we're thinking about and accounting for in this type of work. So one piece of this model is we're thinking about deposition on surfaces and looking at, we're tracking how much virus is in the air and using certain rates of deposition on different fomites that we would expect in these types of environments. Another component is accounting for inhalation of the uh, first responders and also of the patient and how that affects the amount of virus that is still in the air. We're also accounting for hand to surface contact. So once the virus settles onto surfaces, it can then be transferred back and forth between fomites and hands over time. And then we're accounting for hand to face contacts as well. So transfer of the virus from paramedic hands to mucosal membranes on the face. In terms of estimating a dose, we were focused on first responder exposures here, but I think the beauty of this type of model is it's flexible where we could look at patient exposures and risks as well. So in this case, we're tracking dose as a form of how much virus is being transferred or inhaled to the respiratory tracts of the two paramedics and how much virus is being transferred to their mucosal membranes. In this way, we can distinguish how much of the dose is coming from what's being inhaled versus how much of the dose is coming from a contaminated hand-to-face contact, which is originating from contact with a contaminated fomite. And then we're accounting for some losses here, such as exhaust of the air from the ambulance, um, inactivation of the virus on the hands or on the fomites or in the air. And then because we're not accounting for infection risks of the patient, this is acting as a loss. This, um, the inhalation of the patient is removing virus from the air that could be available for inhalation by the paramedics. For our dose response, we are using bootstrapped pairs of alpha and beta for an exact beta Poisson curve. And we're able to account for variability and uncertainty in that dose response relationship. So we can estimate multiple infection risks for a given dose using a curve that looks something like this, where we're relating a given dose to an infection risk. This specific curve was informed by SARS-CoV-1 and human coronavirus 229E, uh, dose response data. And right now that's sort of a, an ongoing gap is that we'd like to have more data related to SARS-CoV-2 so we can approach this part of COVID-19 QMRA with more certainty. For those who are interested in what this means for infectious dose, the infectious dose uh, 50 or the doses that would relate to an infection risk of 0.5 range from 5.5 to 131.2 viral particles with a mean of 29.5 viral particles. So we can still relate these curves to discussions of infectious dose 50 or other um, percentiles, but really the, the key point here is we're not just looking at a minimum infectious dose and someone is infected or they're not based on that minimum infectious dose threshold. We're looking at an entire risk of infection over a range of different doses. So here are our violin plots showing distributions of infection risks that we estimated for our different scenarios. A few things to, to um, focus on in this image is that for scenario one, where the first responders were caring for a COVID-19 patient, we see that risks are generally higher than for scenario two, where the risks are from contaminated fomites, and these are fomite-mediated risks. And this is consistent with some of the other literature describing um, relative contributions to risk, and I'll discuss that later on. We see that the highest risks, regardless of the scenarios, are for those with um, those in the subscenario A, where no one's wearing respirators. We see similar infection risk distributions when the first responders were wearing respirators or when the patient was wearing the respirator. And then we see the lowest risks for when both were wearing respirators. 
Another way to express some of this information regarding risk, especially when we're uncertain about um, dose response relationships or the absolute risk is using risk reductions to compare different scenarios. So using a relative risk approach gives us information about how one intervention may pose risks differently than another um, relative to some type of baseline. So in our case, the baseline is nobody wearing respirators and we can look at by how much these different interventions are reducing a mean infection risk. So if we assume the same efficacy for the um, respirators for the patient as the first responder, there's slightly a greater benefit for using them for source control to limit the amount of virus that's being emitted by the patient. But we know that this is probably not reality, right? The first responders probably have access to fit testing that the patient doesn't have. The patient may have a cloth mask that's not very um, effective. And so what does that mean for risk reduction? Well, the power of modeling is that we essentially have a laboratory or uh, you know, a, a, a field play space at our disposal to explore different scenarios. So we were able to explore what different mask efficacies for the patient specifically meant for risk reduction for the first responders. So we can see that there's a linear relationship uh, between our risk reduction for the first responders and the mask efficacy of the patient. This was for scenarios in which first responders were not wearing masks or respirators and only the patient was wearing a mask or respirator. So we can start exploring, okay, how does this relate to mask efficacies that we're seeing for homemade masks? How can we use this to estimate what risk reductions we might expect for first responders based on that? In terms of scenario two risk reductions, we see that respirators in previous rides affect the fomite contamination for the start of scenario two, and that results in some subsequent risk reduction. So an intervention aimed to um, protect from inhalation exposures actually has some benefits for reducing fomite mediated exposures as well because these bioaerosols deposit or settle on surfaces. When we look at how much virus is actually settling on these different surfaces and comparing them between the different scenarios, we see that uh, subscenarios A and B have a similar distribution of deposition of viruses onto fomites. Uh, so no one wearing respirators or the first responders wearing respirators. And this makes sense because the virus that's being emitted is by the patient in the case of our scenarios. So the first responder wearing respirators isn't going to affect the amount of virus um, in the air that's going to land on surfaces as significantly as the patient wearing a respirator. And so that's why we're seeing a distinction between um, distributions of viruses deposited on fomites between subscenarios A and B, and then subscenarios C and D. So all of these pieces feed together into this risk characterization, where again, we are, we're able to explore risk reductions and compare different interventions. And we also can compare the contributions of different routes to overall infection risks. In terms of transmission route contribution in this work, we saw that there was a greater inhalation route contribution when first responders were not wearing respirators versus when they were. And I think that makes intuitive sense if we think about the fact that when you're wearing a respirator, you're limiting the amount of virus that's being inhaled. And so the amount of um, inhalation as a contribution to dose is decreasing and that decreases this relationship between um, the fractions. But we see a similar pattern regardless of the scenario here, which is that inhalation of the virus tended to drive the infection risks as opposed to hand to um, mucosal membrane contacts of the face. A, an important component of QMRA, especially when we want to do responsible QMRA, is to evaluate how our estimated infection risks stand up against real world data. Are our risks overestimated? Are they underestimated? How realistic do we think we're actually estimating risk? And I think this is one of the biggest um, criticisms and, and probably limitations of QMRA. And this makes it very important to not do QMRA in isolation method methodologically, but to also relate it to epidemiology data and some other methodologies at our disposal to evaluate risks. And so here I'm going to go through a few examples of our estimates from our study and how that stands up against some real world data. So in our scenario for scenario one with a COVID-19 patient, when respirators for first responders and a patient were being worn, we had a mean risk of 0.12%, plus or minus 0.24%.
When no one was wearing respirators, this was slightly greater, but of a similar magnitude, 0.57% plus or minus 0.57%. In a study by Murphy et al, they found that 0.4% of first responders after an encounter with, COVID with a COVID-19 patient were infected. So that's pretty similar in magnitude. Keep in mind that our scenarios are accounting for a single interaction with an infected patient. And some of these are, are more uh, capturing an accruement of exposure. So in comparison to another study that saw 13% of emergency medical services responders on medical leave due, due to COVID-19, and another study with even a higher rate, 22.5% of first responders having seroprevalence, um, but there was variability among first responders potentially due in part to training differences. So there's a lot of confounders at play that we're not necessarily accounting for in our single COVID-19 scenario. However, if we had more human behavior data, we could start exploring how training directly affects different types of contacts or different uses of PPE and estimate how much risk those different behaviors may be contributing or reducing. So in conclusion, we saw that mask or respirator use on patients can protect first responders in future rides due to lower aerosol deposition on fomites. We also saw that source control is beneficial, but that mask efficacy differences between patients and first responders should certainly be accounted for and considered. And then finally, we saw that there were lower risks from the fomite route than for the airborne route, which is consistent with um, current literature. Our second example is looking at air's influence on healthcare worker fomite mediated exposures. So I'm going to go past the hazard ID because the main focus of this work was really on the exposure assessment piece. And I think that this will highlight how variable exposure modeling can be defined. So exposure modeling may be a model we're using to estimate exposure, but to capture fate and transport of a pathogen in an environment, we, need, we may need multiple types of models to capture all of those different mechanisms. So this work utilizes a methodology called computational fluid dynamics, and I'm going to try to play a video and we'll hope that technology is kind to me today. So I think the power of CFD is the visual story that it tells. It makes the invisible visible, and it is a really strong communication tool. You don't, know, you don't have to know any math to be able to watch that video and have some type of message come across to you. The math and methodology behind um, CFD is very complex, and that's why I have CFD friends to help me with this type of research and integrating it into our work. Um, but I think that the, the power of the visual it offers makes it a, a very valuable tool in public health research. In this study, we were looking at two different room setups for patients, and I was collaborating with some researchers in the United Kingdom where it's often uh, used they often use natural ventilation in patient rooms as opposed to the US. So we were exploring a scenario where a breeze is coming in through the windows and we're gonna look at how bioaerosols move around in the room and deposit on surfaces and then use those de deposition patterns to estimate the viral accruement on healthcare worker hands. We were interested in two different room setups, one that I'll be referring to as right facing where the patient is facing the right wall one that I'll be referring to as left facing where the patient's facing the left wall. And because human behavior is such an important component of um, these, these exposures and risks, we wanted to look at three different care types that healthcare workers may be engaging in. So observational care, um, IV drip care and doctor's rounds. So this is a moment of reflection. What do you think? Do you think that simply moving some furniture will make an impact on exposure? Do you think we'll see a difference in fomite mediated exposures between these two room setups? And a follow-up question to that is thinking about what mechanisms are driving those differences. Do you think that we'll see differences in behavior between those two room setups? Or do you think that the main differences will be driven by bioaerosol deposition pattern differences for those two room setups? I don't have all of our CFD methodology here, but if you'd like more details, please feel free to reach out. I've included my contact information at the end, but these are, these are some of the important pieces of our methodology. We assumed a particle injection at the patient mouth with a velocity of 1.3 meters per second. 
And we explored a particle size range of 0.14 to 8.13 informed by um, a norovirus study. So this specific study was exploring norovirus exposures because we were linking it to some bacteriophage data that we had from experimental studies. Something interesting about this size range is it's straddling that five micron cutoff. Again, we're exploring natural ventilation. Uh, the three windows on the back wall are assumed to be velocity inlets with a velocity of 0.3 meters per second. And we assume that the patient door is open as a pressure outlet. And this is something that we're currently exploring in a sensitivity analysis right now to look at how does the direction of flow and the air exchange rate affect our bioaerosol deposition patterns on surfaces and therefore our subsequent fomite mediated exposures. And then again, the outcome of this piece of the work was deposition on surfaces, excuse me, and relating those types to our recorded surface contacts. So in terms of deposition on different surface types, we see that most of the particles pass through the door, which is expected since this is our pressure outlet. So air is generally coming in through the window and going out of the door. But aside from the door, we see that a lot of the particles land on the patient which also makes sense because the patient is emitting these particles. But being able to see how this affects exposures due to hand-to-patient contacts is an interesting piece of this work that I'll get to in a few slides here. Another interesting takeaway was for the left-facing room, we saw a decent amount of deposition on the floor as opposed to in the right-facing room. In this work, we didn't explore contamination beyond the patient room. But it would be interesting in future work to look at how contamination of the floor might contribute to, to contamination of other spaces. So if you know shoes bring that contamination from, from one room to another or portable equipment, how might that affect risks for patients in other environments? In terms of some visuals here for our right facing room, this is showing the different um, tracks of the particles that were emitted and the color corresponds to a residence time. So we see that for the right facing room, a lot of the particles are coming out of the patient mouth and being pushed by the incoming air coming in through those windows on the right side through the door. And this is sort of telling the same story as the figure we saw on the previous slide where there really wasn't that much deposition on surrounding surfaces except for the patient and particles going out the door. For the left facing room, we see a different story where there's a lot uh, more colors, different residence times, and there appears to be a lot more opportunities for these particles to land on surrounding surfaces near the patient and also on the floor. So I'll be using this slide as sort of an anchor to go through the different pieces of the different modeling methods that we're using and the different types of data we're using to inform those models. So we've talked about the CFD component and next I'll talk about an, a microbial transfer model that we're using to estimate viral accruement on hands. A unique component of this work is we were able to use experimental data where we're using bacteriophages or um, viruses that only infect bacteria for measuring transfer efficiency in both directions. Transfer efficiency is the fraction of a contaminant that's transferred from one object to another upon their contact. And this is not unique to microbe exposures. There's a lot of rich literature on this topic in chemical risk assessment related to the loading of lead on hands and pesticides and looking at children's exposures due to their frequent hand to mouth contacts and even putting objects and toys in their mouth as well. Surprisingly, when we set out to do this work, we were thinking about exposure scenarios and we thought, well, if you're in a contaminated environment, as soon as you touch a contaminated surface, your hand is contaminated. If you continue to touch contaminated surfaces, your hand and that surface are theoretically contaminated. How does that affect transfer? To our knowledge, at the point when we were gearing up to do this study, the only papers we could find described transfer efficiency where one of the surfaces was contaminated, either the fomite or the hand, but not both. So we did some bacteriophage, tracers, uh, bacteriophage transfer efficiency studies to see how that affected transfer efficiency. We then calibrated a, mi a microbial transfer model with an approximate Bayesian computation approach to look at what distribution of transfer efficiencies best explain the changes in concentration of the hand and surfaces that we're seeing after a single contact. The outcome of this methodology was a posterior distribution of transfer efficiencies, giving us a range of values that we could plug into our model. So this is a very 
excuse me, simple equation that we're using to track the change in concentration on hands for different contacts where we're using transfer efficiency, the fraction of the, the total hand surface area used for that contact and the viral bio burden. And so a unique component of this work for us was bringing this calibrated distribution of transfer efficiencies informed by experimental data. Another exciting piece of this work and the part that I get the most excited about is the human behavior piece understanding how our behaviors change based on what we're doing and what our macro activities are for that period of time. We had the opportunity to, to observe behaviors during mock care and to use these observed behaviors to inform a human behavior model. And we use sequences of observed behaviors such as sequences of different contacts with surfaces, the donning and doffing of gloves, and hand sanitizer use to inform discrete Markov chains based on observed behaviors during mock care. We then could create discrete Markov chains that were specific to care types and room orientations, giving us six transitional probability matrices. And, and I'm gonna go through some examples for those of you who might be less familiar with this methodology to make it more tangible. So here is a heat map version of those transitional probability matrices, where the darker the color, the more probable the transition. So without really knowing how to read these, just looking from left to right, looking at the different uh, room orientations and the different care types, we see some similarities and some interesting differences between the two room layouts and the three care types. And I'll run through one example here. So a way to interpret this is let's consider these rows to label what I'm doing now. And we'll consider the columns to label what I'm going to do next. So in our simulation, we're creating sequences of behavior. Let's say that in this specific moment in the simulation, I'm making a hand to equipment contact. What am I going to do next? How does the model decide? Well, it looks across and says, given that you're currently touching an equipment contact, the probability that you then use um, an alcohol-based hand sanitizer or touch another equipment surface or any of these other behaviors is indicated by a transitional probability. In this case, the color of the rectangle here represents the transitional probability where the darker the color, the more probable. So in this case, if I'm making a hand to equipment contact, my next behavior is pretty likely to be another equipment contact or repetitive contact with that same surface. I'm also fairly likely to touch the patient. And so in this way, we can generate many different sequences of behavior and explore what, which sequences resulted in the greatest exposures and what's common about those sequences? Can we do anything about those types of behaviors? All of our sequences start with in or entrance into the patient room. And all of our sequences end with out. And we call this an absorbing state. So once a, a simulated person exits a patient room, they're not going to touch a far patient surface or something that's physically impossible, right? That's the end of the simulation. And so here's an interesting visual of what those different sequences can look like. So what we're doing is generating thousands and thousands of, of different sequences of behaviors and estimating exposures for those sequences. But if we zoom into one specific iteration, we can see interesting stories or anecdotes evolve out of some of these, these iterations. So this is one story for one healthcare worker that we're simulating where they're making a number of different contacts. We're looking at the viral particles per square centimeter on their hands over the number of contacts. And we see that there's some fluctuations, there's some increases, there's some decreases. They don their gloves at this pink spot here near uh, like the one third or so of the way through. They make some contacts with the patient. We see really high and fast viral crewment on the hands given by that sort of neon green dot. And then they doff their gloves. And we see a big decrease in the viral crewment on the outer surface of that, that glove being doffed. And now this is limiting their exposure. If they were to make a hand-to-face -face contact right after doffing their gloves, that risk would be much less to them than if they had touched their face while their gloves were on. But following glove doffing, we see that um, this particular person makes some contacts with the patient and the concentration on their hand at one point reaches a concentration that was even greater than it was with their gloves on. So this story tells us something interesting about the timing of these different PPE interventions and how important uh, the question of when should I be wearing gloves and when should I be taking off gloves is for this type of exposure. 
In terms of what those transitional probabilities or sequences mean for the actual frequency of different events occurring, this is a breakdown of what that looks like by room orientation and care type. We see that for the doctor's rounds, regardless of the room orientation, there are more contacts with the patient than for the other care types. When we look across the left facing and right facing rooms, we see some slight subtle differences between the frequencies of different events. So let's explore whether that means anything interesting for differences in exposure. So, so far we've talked about how to um, incorporate QMRA or what are the components of QMRA. And we just finished up an example showing human behaviors and how those are, in are incorporated into exposure modeling. And um, we're about to show more about the importance of estimating their exposures and risks. But we showed one example of that through our iteration example, our single iteration. So in terms of mean concentrations on the right hand over time, plus or minus the 95% confidence interval, we do see some interesting differences between the left facing and the right facing room. One question that our team had was, well, are these differences due to differences in behaviors that we saw between the two room orientations, or is it more driven by differences in the bioaerosol deposition patterns? So we thought, well, why don't we hold the bioaerosol deposition patterns constant and just let the behaviors vary and see if we, if we see anything interesting. So that's what these top two figures show is holding the bioaerosol deposition pattern constant, allowing behaviors to change based on left or right facing room orientations. And we still see that interesting difference that we see below where both of those um, are making a, a contribution. Regardless of room orientation, we see that doctor's rounds results in faster viral accruement on the hands over time than the other two care types. And now I'm going to explore why that might be. So recall that when we were talking about where different particles were depositing, that the patient was one of the um, surfaces where we saw the greatest amount of particle deposition regardless of the room orientation. Another challenge with this work related to the patient contacts was that we had calibrated transfer efficiencies for hand to, hand to fomite contacts or hand to equipment contacts. Our calibrated, calibrated transfer efficiencies ranged from 0.49% to 0.78%. For patients, there were very little to no data describing skin to skin transfer efficiency or glove to skin or skin to glove transfer efficiency. Due to this uncertainty, we explored a range of transfer efficiencies observed in the literature, and these vary widely due to relative humidity, um, differences based on the organism or the, the wetness of the surface, the surface type. There's even been some arguments that wide variability is seen in transfer efficiency studies due to um, difficulties in controlling the experiments themselves. So we used a wide distribution to reflect our uncertainty about these hand-to-patient contacts. This means that someone in our simulation could touch a patient, one of the most contaminated surfaces in our model, and a large amount of available virus could be transferred to the hands. Whereas if they touch an equipment surface, which already likely has less virus on it in our model than the patient, a smaller fraction of that available virus can be transferred. So this kind of brings up the question, are transfer efficiencies more important than we think they are? In this study, it appears that transfer efficiency might be having an effect on our estimated exposures. Traditionally, transfer efficiency doesn't come out as one of the most influential parameters in exposure modeling. But if, they, if these transfer efficiencies are very surface specific, they can a, appear to have a, a big difference. And exposure modeling allows us to explore um, the effect of these different parameters and helps us identify data gaps. Another explanation for differences between these different care types is that there's more transitions to hand to patient contacts for doctor's rounds than for any other type of care. And that's consistent with the frequency plot we saw where doctor's rounds had more hand to patient contacts contributing to the overall events in their simulations than the other care types. Another power of exposure modeling is to explore interventions and quantify how these are affecting our exposures. So in this case, we looked at the effect of hand sanitizer events normalized by the total number of events in our simulation and what this means for the mean concentration on both hands. And we can see that regardless of room orientation or care type, that the more hand sanitizer events you have per total events, um, the smaller the mean concentration on hands. 
we do see some slight differences in the slopes here across different room orientations or care types, but overall it had a fairly similar effect. And this was an interesting output for us to look at how much of an effect would increasing the frequency of hand sanitizer events have on exposure. In terms of risk characterization, we did not have self-inoculation data, or in other words, data describing how frequently healthcare workers may be touching their face during episodes of care. And so we used more of a relative risk approach where we looked at what if a healthcare worker touched a mucosal membrane at the very end of the episode of care with whatever is on their hands in that given moment, how would these different room orientations and care types compare? And we saw that for left-facing rooms, doctor's rounds would result in 164% and 32% greater mean infection risks relative to IV care and observational care, respectively. For the right-facing rooms, we saw 118% and 192% greater mean infection risks for doctor's rounds relative to these other care types. We also saw that mean infection risk for doctor's rounds in the right-facing rooms was 62% greater than for the left-facing rooms. We saw a similar pattern for IV care where there were greater risks for the right-facing room than for the left-facing room, but we saw the inverse for observational care where left-facing rooms resulted in slightly greater infection risk than the right-facing rooms. And so again, a limitation of this component was that we were looking at infection risk for single hand-to-face contact, but QMRA allows us the ability to still compare some of these exposures by using more of a relative risk approach. In some simulated cases, a hand-to-face contact was made with a freshly donned glove resulting in a zero dose, which emphasizes the timing of PPE and the timing of hand hygiene. One of the limitations of this model was not having data for self-inoculation behaviors, but using an exposure modeling methodology uh, revealed this data gap for us. And it made us realize if we had more information about these types of behaviors, we could more accurately estimate risks. In terms of how this relates to practice, this study was exploring or highlighting the importance of the five moments of hand hygiene, not just how often do we use PPE or use hand sanitizer, but when do we use hand sanitizer? In our model, we're really looking at moments four and five after touching a patient or after touching patient surroundings. And we're seeing that moment four may be contributing more to infection risk than moment five. So even though all these moments are important, we can start looking at their relative contributions to exposure and risk. Some of the limitations include validation of the CFD, CFD model, and there are some challenges with validating natural ventilation CFD models, but our collaborators have um, some really great uh, chambers at their disposal. So we're hoping to do more work related to that validation process. Um, because we're exploring natural vent uh, ventilation in these rooms, it may be less generalizable to US hospitals, but a methodology like this could easily be adapted to exploring mechanical ventilation or looking at what if we approached designed with a more sustainable lens and we were incorporating natural ventilation into US hospitals. And then again, transfer efficiencies for hand to patient contacts is something that could greatly increase our certainty in this type of work. In terms of how this relates to um, the hierarchy of controls, healthcare environments are very challenging because we can't eliminate or substitute pathogens, right? There's gonna be people who are ill in a healthcare setting we can't eliminate or substitute that. That's just part of the environment. That makes engineering controls very important. An interesting outcome of this work that I don't think we really expected was that room layout would have a, an effect on human behavior in a way that actually translated to differences in estimated risks. And so understanding how the design of different spaces changes the way we interact with surfaces and the environment can be a really interesting way forward to advance QMRA and advance exposure science. In terms of the other controls, such as gloves, which was the PPE focus in this work, and hand sanitizer, we saw that they can have a meaningful difference for decreasing exposures, but the timing of these interventions is very important. Overall conclusions from the two examples I gave today are that interventions aimed to reduce bioaerosol exposures can disrupt mechanisms of fomite-mediated exposures that behaviors can vary by macro activity or in our case procedures or care types, and that this could be influenced by room layout. 
We also saw that there's relationships between human behavior and transmission within indoor environments, that these can be very complex, but that modeling offers us a controlled space to explore some of these relationships for informing and designing better interventions. Some of the challenges with exposure modeling that I've tried to highlight throughout is we're really at the mercy of the data that are available to us, but a, a sort of sidestep to that is it's a powerful tool for identifying data gaps. So this kind of goes both ways as a strength and weakness. It can be difficult to validate some of these models. It can also be difficult to measure the things we're trying to exposure in the real world or uh, measure the things we're trying to estimate in the real world. And again, these are complex systems of, of exposure. We're trying to account for different human behaviors and different pathogen viability in a number of different environments. So the question of the day, what can exposure modeling tell us? Exposure modeling can help us estimate risks or give us risk reductions offered by different interventions to allow us to compare them. It can describe relationships between transmission routes and explore how these different transmission routes interplay with human behavior and what that means for exposure. And then of course, identifying gaps, what are we missing in the exposure pathway picture? And hopefully you feel like we've achieved all of the learning objectives. And thank you very much for your time and attention today. Um, please feel free to reach out to me over email or Twitter if you'd like to um, continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your research with us. Um, at this time, we are gonna open it up to questions. Um, so if you have a question, you're more than welcome to enter it into the online Q&A box and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Um, our first question that came in um, in example one, could persistent airborne virus contribute to the second patient's exposure? That's a great question. That's something that we are currently actually thinking about. Um, we didn't address that in this work because there's some uncertainty about the time in between patient rides. And in conversation with some first responders, they sometimes will open the um, back doors of the vehicle in between rides to air it out. So there's some uncertainty about um, how much virus is still lingering in the air in between rides, but that's something we could explore with this type of modeling. Thank you so much. We also have some questions about um, the term respirator versus face covering. Um, in these scenarios, does the term respirator mean a face covering? It looked like a lot of the pictures were actual respirators. Yeah, so we wanted to look at sort of an apples to apples comparison of a patient wearing a respirator with the same efficacy versus a first responder to look at, um, you know, a source control versus a protection type of benefit. But of course, most patients are probably not going to be wearing a respirator, uh, which is, let me go to that slide, which is why we explored a number of different efficacies to explore how um, that might affect risk reductions for first responders. Let me see if I can find it. Great, thank you. Oh, yeah, there we go. This is on another question I see. Um, patients aren't fit tested for specific makes and models of respirators. So how does this compare to first responders wearing respirators that are provided by their employer and fit tested specifically for them? Right, that's a, an excellent question. And and this is what we're, we're trying to answer that question through this figure, looking at how mask efficacy for the patient will affect risk reductions for the first responders. Thank you. Um, also, can you tell us what sparked your interest in occupational and industrial hygiene? Yeah, so actually before I did my graduate work, I was a middle school math teacher. And in my first year, I blew through all of my sick leave time within like the first month and I was constantly getting sick at, at work uh, to the point where I started, I had this one infection where my sternum actually got infected and it, I was having all the symptoms of a heart attack. So my husband like rushed me to the ER and they said, oh, your sternum's infected from this weird thing that I got at school. And so I started to think, you know, it's hard enough to be a teacher, but to deal with all of these microbial exposures and being ill, getting in the way of doing my job, you know, it started, it started making me think a lot about that, which inspired me to go to graduate school. Thank you so much for sharing that story. I'm sure that resonates with a lot of people in the, the occupational health and safety world. Thank you. Great. Um, someone else also asked, most hospital rooms have closed windows. Can this model be used with closed windows? Yes, it can. So we would just have to adjust the CFD component. 
Um, and that's something we could explore in the sensitivity analysis we're doing now, where we're looking at how does direction of flow and differences in bioaerosol deposition patterns affect some of the conclusions we were seeing. So in our work, we weren't seeing a, a huge effect of bioaerosol deposition pattern differences between the, room, the two room orientations on exposure, but it's possible that you know, we could explore under what circumstances would you see really big bioaerosol deposition patterns that actually meant something for exposure differences. Thank you. This actually is kind of a building on of that question on whether the model could be used with treatment rooms that might have closed windows but the door open. Yeah, so, you know, door, door open, door closed. I mean, there's a lot of different scenarios that we could explore one of the challenges is looking at, you know, the, the transient movement of particles versus steady state. And that would get a little bit more complex, but there, there definitely is the power of doing that in CFD and linking that with some of our exposure models. Thank you so much. Um, another question here, are shorter people more prone to higher degrees of exposure? Have you noticed height as a parameter? That's a very interesting question. I'm very interested in that as a as a relatively short person. <laughs> um, we haven't we haven't explored that in our data. Most of what we are looking at is task or role type and differences between um, different procedures and things like that. I have looked at you know data for adults versus children in terms of frequency of hand to face contacts or putting things in your mouth. You know, there's obviously a height difference there, but I think the main difference is developmental in terms of you know, as we get older, we just um, don't put don't put toys in our you know objects in our our mouth or touch our face as much as when we're children. Thank you. Um, have you explored the differences in bioaerosol deposition in positive airflow rooms versus negative airflow rooms? That's a very interesting question. I have not, but it's very possible that my collaborators have done that. So I encourage you to look up work by um, Professor Catherine Noakes and Dr. Marco Felipe King. They've done a lot of very interesting work on this topic. Thank you so much. And um, we do have time for a few more questions. So again, if you have any questions, please do feel free to enter them into the online chat and Q&A box here. Um, I'm also curious if you're continuing on with this work, what are your next steps? What are, I guess, your next variables as you consider other exposures and modeling? Yeah, that's an exciting question. I think that some of my next steps are definitely identifying more of our human behavior gaps. I think that's one of uh, our major limitations where we set out to do a risk assessment. And one of the first questions is, what are people doing in this environment? How long are they in this environment? What are they wearing in terms of PPE? Are they touching surfaces? Uh, if you know, if we're focused on fomite-mediated exposures, and there's often very limited data describing that. I think this year was the first year I even saw, um, you know, more than two papers describing how frequently how frequently we touch our faces as adults, even though that was one of the first messaging pieces coming out of the CDC was avoid contact with your face. There's there are very little data describing how frequently adults actually do touch their face, let alone touch a mucosal membrane of the face capable of causing an infection. Yeah, I know myself included. You never realize how much you touch your face until you're paying attention. <laughs> Thank you. Um, another theme that we've seen through a lot of our industrial hygiene webinars is looking at exposure assessment and also exposure modeling. Um, can you speak a little bit to why you, you're choosing to do this through exposure modeling and what benefits that might have in comparison to actually going in the field and doing exposure assessment? Sure, that's an important question. I think exposure modeling I'm drawn to it because I enjoy sort of the creative aspect of it. It's sort of a, a play space to explore a number of different scenarios. And I can explore a number of different scenarios in the span of a day that would take me months, if not years to do in real life. Um, but that's not to say exposure models are, are everything. You know, I think informing these models with real world data and using them to, to optimize and focus exposure assessment efforts is a, a real benefit to this methodology. So I think they're definitely important in tandem. Great, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today. Um, we do have a couple more minutes. If anyone has a question that we missed, please do feel free to enter it into the online chat and Q and A. Um, otherwise, I'm going to start doing our, our closing comments here. So we'll see if anything else comes through. Oh, I did miss one. How realistic is it to assume there is transmission from surfaces and why? I think it depends on the organism that you're interested in. Um, 
yeah, I mean, that's a huge can of worms <laughs> um, that I don't know that I can open in a few minutes, but I would say it, it definitely depends on the organism and the mechanisms through which that organism is being deposited on fomites. Thank you so much. And we have a comment. Very impressive. Thank you. <laughs> so thank oh, you so nice. much for your presentation today. Um, I appreciate everyone joining us online for this webinar. Um, oh, we actually have one more. Are you aware of other exposure modeling methodologies used in other fields, for example, pharmaceutical industry? Interesting. I haven't read exposure modeling work in pharmaceutical industries, but I have seen um, different dose response or, or toxicology work in that field, which has been very interesting. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson, and thank you to everybody who joined us for today. Um, the Education and Research Center Industrial Hygiene Webinar Series takes place the second Tuesday of every month. And this series is in addition to our ERC Ergonomics Webinar Series, which is the third Wednesday of each month. So you can learn more about our upcoming webinars online at coeh.berkeley.edu backslash about CE. I'm also really excited to tell you about an event we have coming up this Thursday and Friday, February 11th and 12th. CUEH at UC Berkeley and UC Davis will be hosting CUEH Builds Bridges, Interdisciplinary and Ethical Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic. This is a virtual symposium and we're gonna be highlighting interactive panel discussions and Q&A. We also have pre-recorded presentations which are now available. And all the sessions from the symposium will also be recorded and made available following the event. So to learn more about our webinars and that event and much more, please check out our website. Again, that's coeh.berkeley.edu backslash about CE. Um, and this presentation has been recorded. We'll send you all an email with a link to the evaluation and the recording um, tomorrow. It'll come automatically from Zoom. Thank you again for joining us today. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone.